Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. Today on the podcast, we have the pleasure of being joined by Jim Rowan, who is a principal at Deloitte and leads Deloitte Consulting's strategy and analytics practices. He helps clients transform their businesses using data-powered AI solutions that essentially enable better decision-making. So Jim has served clients across the life sciences, healthcare, and telecommunications industry. He also has um, you know, really deep knowledge on the finance function in these organizations, having led analytics, planning, and forecasting that enables the finance function to embrace digital transformation. We're super excited to have you on the show today. Welcome, Jim. Jaden, thanks so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And thanks for, uh, thanks for the chance to chat with you as well. I'm um, really excited to be on and talk about the AI space and what uh, what's going on. I've been enjoying listening to your podcast and hearing what you're talking about with everyone. So thanks for getting the messages out and engaging in some really exciting dialogue. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, like I mentioned, really excited to have you on. But what I would love to kind of kick this off with is I'm wondering if you can uh, walk us through a little bit of your journey to becoming a principal at Deloitte and kind of leading the strategy and analytics practices. Tell us about you know your journey. What brought you here? Was this something you always envisioned you'd be doing? Is this something that kind of evolved? Give us a bit of your your journey there. Have you ever wanted to start your own podcast? I record and publish podcasts on a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and I absolutely love it. Essentially, you can upload from your phone or computer, and it distributes to every platform that plays podcasts. They support video podcasts, and you can make money on the platform with ads or even podcast subscriptions, something that has made my life so much easier as a podcaster. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you give it a try. You can download the Spotify for Podcast app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your podcast today. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. Yeah, so I went to college at Boston College. I always thought I was going to work in sort of the technology and finance space and really wanted to work at the intersection of the two of those things. Had the really fortunate opportunity to get an offer to join Deloitte straight out of my undergrad degree. And I'm probably one of those rare, random people out there that's been with their company for almost their entire career. So I took oh, wow. as an analyst. Yeah, which is pretty strange. And I really had a chance to work my way up to the ranks within Deloitte. Um, and a lot of it's been really like amazing opportunities to get to work with some of the best companies in the world, um, helping them solve some of their most interesting and challenging problems. And I was really fortunate when I started that one of my first engagements was actually around data and analytics. And I was doing projects around customer lifetime value, predicting customer churn behaviors. Um, and we don't think we really called some of those things AI topics back in the day. It was just advanced right. analytics, but it was great to be part of that journey. Um, and you know, at Deloitte, we talk a lot about sort of your career being a bit of a marathon versus a sprint. And so, mm. you know, I read the chance to serve across a number of different industries and sectors, play a number of different roles within the organization. And most recently, I run our strategy and analytics business, um, which is where we serve our clients across the breadth of business strategy problems. So where to play and how to win in a specific market all the way through deep technical AI related challenges, um, data challenges our clients face as well. So really cool uh, opportunity. And I'm just really enjoying my career here at the firm. Amazing. Super cool. Love that. Um, and that's really, that's really cool. That you've been able to, you know, just kind of work your way up in the same place for so long, not something a lot of people have the privilege of doing. So that's really cool. Um, something I would love to ask you about, and I know like there are some limitations to what you can say because of, you know, client relation, uh, you know, anonymity and those types of things. But I'm wondering, um, from you know what you can tell us, what are some of the most transformative AI solutions that you've helped implement in the life sciences, healthcare, and kind of telecommunication sectors? Are there really any uh, interesting things you've been able to help implement? Yeah, I mean, like over the course of my career, I've had a chance to do some really cool projects um, with our clients, and I think I'd sort of step back and say some of the most interesting things that we get to do are really around business transformation, where we're really helping our clients change how they do it, what they're trying to do today. And normally infuse that with new technology. And so early on, it was data or analytics. Now we're doing a lot of transformations with AI. And the transformations come at it in sort of two different angles. Sometimes it's a growth transformation. You want to grow into a new market, expand revenue. Sometimes it's a, a cost transformation where we're trying to save costs and be more efficient. 
And sometimes we're lucky to be able to do both of those, right? Where we're really able to help them. Um, and some of the really cool ones I've had a chance to get involved with are around like how clients are using, like let's say natural language processing to improve, uh, improve efficiencies, how they're getting their work done, taking document intakes and being able to summarize those in really clear, articulate fashion so they can summarize large volumes of information, help drive efficiency within the organization. Um, the other things that I think have been really cool is actually setting up uh, AI COEs for our clients where it's not just the project that we're doing, but it's building a whole capability within the organization so that it's not just a single point of transformation, but they're able to then expand that transformation over a period of time as new technologies have come in. Um, and I can give a couple examples where you know, we've started off with clients on an automation COV. Like we don't talk about robotic process automation anymore. It's like not, you know, it's not super exciting. However, it drives a ton of value. Yeah, I mean, so starting at such a like really early part of the journey and then helping clients expand into AI and other aspects of what they're doing uh, has been really cool. And I think that's been a fun area to see a lot of that transformation. That's super cool. Something I'd be curious to ask you, because I, I know you kind of work in this space and, and you do this a lot with people is like, what are some of the most popular, like, you know, you talk about different automation and different things you're helping people to shift within the organization. You're implementing a lot of AI tools. What are some of the most popular things that you're seeing today? Um, that people are using AI for to to make changes and maybe like I know you work in a lot of different industries so across industry like yeah. what are some of the high level things people are using AI for um, to to make some of these transformations? Yeah, I mean it's God, it's a, it's a great question because there's such a breadth of different places where AI is getting yeah. used. Like one of the things, and, and we can hopefully loop this into the show notes, is a little bit like we have this AI dossier that we talk about and then AI right. dossiers lists like a huge list of use cases across different yeah. sectors people can navigate. Um, but where I'm seeing like the really interesting technology, people are starting to get really involved like the marketing space. So they're using AI, generating content from a marketing perspective um, has been a big push. We're also seeing organizations just spend a lot of time on proofs of concept. So, so, they're, so they've heard about the technology. Everyone had their Gen AI moment you know, a little over a year ago where they started to play with chat GPT and understand it. And so they've been spending most of the year figuring out how, did this, how does this apply to my business? And yeah. that gets really specific by sector. So it's hard to say like one big thing, but when you get into, let's say like the finance function, there's a lot of opportunity to summarize large volumes of data that you're getting and, and incorporate that into new reporting and analytics layers. Um, there's also some cool use cases. I think that we're seeing where um, you see like your know, clients have a, a vast sort of array of data across their organizations. It's normally siloed, maybe they grew up through acquisition. So there are different systems that are connecting these things together. And we're seeing a lot of value in sort of the enterprise search capability where they're able to kind of put in a layer on top of the data and okay. be able to search across that, you know, do better analytics through that as well. So those are some areas that we're seeing that I think are kind of cool. Okay. And I, I know you mentioned like briefly there, the finance. I'm wondering like if there's yeah. any kind of, you know, like how do you approach integrating AI into the the finance function of, of an organization? Yeah, finance is a fascinating function. I've spent a lot of time serving that group and think like corporate finance, not yeah. sort of Wall Street or banking capital markets finance. Okay. And that group, they, you, you have as a CFO a ton of fiduciary responsibility for your organization, right? So you're a major steward of the overall company's finances, as well as sort of the desire to be a bit of a strategist, a business partner, you're like you're connecting in a bunch of different areas. And so for finance specifically, like you've got to have a very good mindset of like, you can I trust the information I'm working with? And then you start to layer in sort of analytics and AI capabilities around it. And one of the things I worked really closely with uh, some of our clients on is doing predictive modeling. So how can okay. I use the data that we have in our organization to build out predictions about how certain products, different markets are going to behave and using that into like build into our forecasting systems. Um, what I've also seen finance do a really nice job of is being like this business partner by using the rest of the information that they have and linking it together with the business case data that they have and really like trying to get the, the um, their business partners on the other side of the organization to understand the financial implications of what they're trying to do. And okay. for finance, that's a really great opportunity for them to, to improve. So that's like maybe like the corporate finance function. Yeah, There's a ton of opportunities like in, in some of the other back office or operational finance areas around accounts payable, accounts receivable where we've seen a lot of improvement in efficiencies in terms of, of collections and things like that that clients are doing. Okay, super, super cool. Um, of course, so much innovation is happening right now. Something that I would love to ask you, Jim, is you know what's one piece of advice you wish someone had given you when you first started with, 
you know, working with AI and, and analytics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of advice. Um, the nice thing about delayed culture is you've got a lot of mentors that are trying to help you along the way. So I might have gotten the advice and maybe ignored it a few times along the way as well. Um, so it's important to, you know, like make sure that you're actually listening for the advice. Uh, I, I've done a lot of reporting projects. And if you think about sort of what reporting projects look like, you, you have the common data set, you know, you need to build some reports. They look like a certain thing. And back in the day, they looked a lot like, you know, cross tab spreadsheets with a bunch of information on it. And one of the things that is super important that we started to remind our teams about and really like the thing I w- wish was even more further emphasized for me was, was that like, what's the purpose of those reports? Like, why are we actually doing all this work? Really focusing on like, what's the value that we're creating? We might have done like a ton of math to figure out some KPIs. Great. But what are we going to do with the KPIs when we have them? Like, what's the purpose of the KPI? How do we like actually do some action once we have this piece of information? And I think like that really helps a ton when you think about, and I wish we spend more time on that because it's also about the like sort of the design of the reports and how you want to engage with information and the importance of that in that process. And I think about it as like, you know, if you're p- going through Tiles reports every week, you get a dashboard, great. But like, do you always really look at the dashboard on your computer? Or are you engaging with it on your mobile device? Do you really want to engage with the dashboard and find your different intersections or save views? Or would you rather actually just have an alert that tells you, hey, by the way, sales were off by this. Something was up, up by why. This is the region. And so really making sure that you think about that design element up front, because sometimes we just want to go and create the reports. We want to kind of get that piece done and get the information out there. I think that's a really lost opportunity to really do true analytics work and true like design work around the information. So that's a little bit of like a lesson learned, I think, and some advice I wish, you know, I'd gotten a little bit earlier in my career. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic advice. And uh, I'm sure that's useful for a lot of people listening. So I do really appreciate you sharing that. Um, When we're looking at, you know, organizations scaling AI, you know, deployment, I'm wondering what are some common challenges that you you know from your vantage point you see organizations are currently facing when they're trying to you know scale or you know scale ai deployment and how do they kind of overcome those challenges yeah there's a ton of like you know, scaling ai has been a big topic you see a lot of articles and conversations about it um a couple of things come to mind where thinking about first you think about sort of the talent so you do you have the people around the solution to be able to actually take it to production and then support it when it gets to production so that's one challenge the second one that comes up a lot is sort of the value case. Like sometimes when you look at a business case, it looks pretty good. Um, you do a proof of concept. It sort of proves out a little bit. But then what happens when you go to scale it? Will we actually see the enterprise benefits that we talk about? So that's something that takes a little bit of effort and challenge some of the organizations are, are facing as well. Um, the other piece I would say in that is a little bit around like regulatory, legal, like how is your internal organization thinking about the ramifications of what you've got pulled together? And sometimes what we see clients do is they get a, a team together, they start working on a proof of concept, proof of concept looks great, but uh, they didn't build a cross-functional team that included the legal risks teams, et cetera, as part of the journey. And so they start to hit a bit of a roadblock that says, oh, can we take this to production? Well, we didn't do the right things to check to see um, that we put all the right guardrails around the model that we built. Did we put in the right controls in the legal department? Did we think about how this was going to work? Um, and so those can be some of the roadblocks that I would say like stop organizations from scaling along the way. And there, you, a lot of it goes back to like, what was the original intent and how forward focuses the organization in terms of what they're trying to achieve. If they've put AI at the center of their strategy, they want to be an AI fueled business, then they'll knock through these roadblocks as they go through them and they won't feel like roadblocks. They'll feel like the right decision points along the journey. Um, so that's some of the things that we see. The other things that, that pop up too is just, you know, couple of failed POCs and people lose the energy to go after it. Like maybe this okay. was, these didn't work, right? And you're like, yeah. that's part of the journey. We're going to learn along the way. And if it fails, well, we got to be willing to sort of, you know, dust ourselves off, get back up and try a new use case. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so critical. Um, like AI, obviously, it can, is going to be integrated. It's currently being integrated into everything. There's so many incredible tools. And uh, yeah, just because the, the first one you try isn't a home run, I, you know, I just encourage, you know, the enterprise, like continue to try to build out these use cases. There's amazing applications and it's just like any startup, right? Like product market fit is not always guaranteed or immediate. doesn't mean you give up. You just pivot till you find it. And, uh, you know, ultimately that makes you successful. But that does bring up, you know, a big question a lot of people have around ROI. 
So I would love to ask you, you know, like how do you measure the impact and ROI of AI initiatives in a business? This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. Yeah, and, and the, what you're saying too back in the last point as well is like the, the complexity of the AI ecosystem is huge, right? Like there's so many different players. Which ones do I trust? How do I pull them into my environment? Who can get through like cyber risk checks? Who doesn't? Um, do I go with a hyperscaler? Do I go with small players? So that adds to a lot of the complexity of the space. And, and that leads a little bit into the value conversation, actually, because you, a traditional business case analysis, you do your analysis of what are the costs that are inputs that are going into it, what's the value you expect to create, and a very straightforward quantitative and qualitative you know, list of benefits. And I think there are a couple of different areas that start to trip people up in the value case conversation. Um, the first on the cost side, you, and I think organizations have started to feel this a little bit on the cloud areas. They want to, let's move to the cloud. It'll be less expensive. We'll figure out how to get you there. And then sometimes you get some cloud bills that are a lot more expensive than what you expect. So there's a little bit of like, what's this really going to cost me when I try to model this getting to production? So that's one that can kind of trip us up in sort of the value case conversation. Um, there's also like a lot of, hey, I'm going to save some time. Great. What are you going to do with the time you've saved? And that's where it gets a lot of the conversation because you end up with a lot of, I use the term like partial FTE savings in the organization. Um, so it saved me 15 minutes to do a task every day. Is that like a task you then multiply times an hourly rate and apply that across the organization? I don't know if that's going to fly as much as maybe saying, well, you know, these six things added up to a full hour. And with that time, I'm now able to do you know, more interactions with my customers or things like that. So you, you have to think about like what you're going to get with the time that you've saved in some uh -huh. of these conversations. Um, and so that's a little bit of some of the challenges when you think about sort of the quality to quantitative benefits. Um, and we really encourage organizations like when you're thinking about this, like take the use cases, map them out on sort of a heat map of where you think the biggest value is going to be. Have some of these conversations and as you're trying them out, you start to understand where some of the gaps are, um, you know, in terms of the organization's ability to realize those value. And also, like, be super honest with each other about, like, these are the risks. Like, you know, we want to go do this, and this is some of the risks. You know, we could see uh, customer adoption issue, things like that. And so we also encourage, encourage organizations to pilot. You know, if you're going to do this, roll it out at scale, um, start to pilot the, this to prove out the value. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so, so critical. Um, I'm wondering if you can share, like, a, an actual example of a project where, you know, maybe AI significantly improved decision making and the whole, you know, kind of the decision making process. Yeah, I mean, AI you, is a tool to drive decisions is, is a critical factor, but we also need to think about it as like a humans plus machines conversation. And so when you think about this, like we were talking about this at, at a meeting last week where we we're thinking about you know, what's the implication of using the, the quality of the model from an AI perspective, if you're making, let's say, a finance decision versus if you're a doctor, and you're reading, you know, and, and medical AI solutions giving you some advice on what you should do. Like your tolerance for errors might be different in the finance space than, let's say, a patient and how you're going to engage with a patient. And so when you think about decision making, you have to sort of have that framework of like, okay, what are we using the AI solution to make the decisions for? What are the guardrails around it? What's the level of accuracy? Um, and we've seen a lot of success in terms of doing like some of the predictive modeling capabilities. Um, driving insights off of data and large volumes of data sets where you're trying to drive unique and different insights are really like helpful to try to drive you know, where you're seeing AI as a solution for analytics and better information. Um, so I would say those are like two kind of primary areas. It, the part of it though is like making sure that you have to step back and say like, okay, what's my source data? Can I trust it? And go through like the, I would say the less exciting tasks of this space, which is making sure the foundation is right to build on getting that organized, putting it in a way you can organize it, and get, then you can start driving value from the AI and decisions, using AI to drive decisions versus just assuming that we can get a model together and somehow it's going to work magic. Um, which I feel like sometimes there's a little bit of like uh, excitement in the air, if you will, around yeah, the yeah. ability for AI to sort of drop in there and give you the right answer. 
Yep. No, I think you're I think you're spot on with that. Um, something I would love to ask you about is your prediction. So you have a I think you have a very unique kind of vantage point in the industry and, and looking at, at companies that you're working with. Where do you see specifically from the things that you're working on? Where do you see the evolution of AI over, over the next? You know, I used to ask people over the next like five to 10 years. I think I feel like things advance so much. Like, give me the next three to five years. Uh, what are some yeah, things right? that like, you think would change? That's a crazy threshold. I mean, five to ten years is, is hard to think that far that far out. And I'm sure there's some great folks that are doing that, uh, helping to plan it. So I guess for me, a couple of things. One, um, we're going to see definite advancement in model accuracy. I think we're going to be able to see far more efficiency in the models that we have running as well. So more tailored. Like thinking about the large language model market, like do we have you know, smaller versions of large language models that are able to run uh, more efficiently on edge AI devices um, that allow us to do new and different things sort of around around the AI space. So like that's one thing I think we'll see a little bit more of, um, and that miniaturization effect sort of, of of the model itself and of the capability and the ability to run on the edge. Um, we talked a little bit about like the startup ecosystem players. I mean, there's a ton of players. We can go through a number of them. Amazing, and exciting space where new startups are forming. Really cool solutions. Um, I think we're going to start to see some consolidation in that space as well. Um, yeah. And so that, which I mean, I think isn't like a wild prediction. So you tend to see this right. with new technologies. Um, the other thing that I, I think will be interesting is that we're going to start to use more AI technologies and not even know we are. Like we do it today, but the embeddedness of the AI capabilities and the things that we do is going to be so like part of our day to day activity. We might not even know what we've already gone down and had AI be part of our journey. Um, so that's going to be important for both companies and you know, both for their employees and for their customers to figure out how they're communicating that. Because I think you're going to then start getting to sort of this trust equation of like, well, has this model been running all the time and I didn't know about it? Like, should I yeah. have been told? Um, but I really liked that I got that information. So what's the what's the give and the get on that? Um, and then I'm not a, not a lawyer. I don't follow enough of the political scene, but I'm going to imagine the regulation also in the next year, three to five years becomes a you know, major yeah. part of what we're dealing with in this space. Um, and it's still, it has been already today, and I think it will continue to be a major part of what we have to navigate with four organizations that are trying to figure out how to AI fuel their business, but also you know, for professional services firms trying to add value in around our clients. Like, how do we do that and what are the risks? Yep. Yeah, I love that. I think that's super, super applicable. Um, so I asked you earlier, you know, what advice you wish you had received. Now, what I'd love to ask you is, you know, what advice would you give to businesses that maybe are just starting to explore the potential of AI and, and kind of data analytics? Yeah, luckily, like, yeah, advice to clients and advice to businesses is sort of the job that we're in. So that's a <laughs> that's a question we get a lot. Um, I mean, if, you, if an organization is just starting on their journey, I think it's important to sort of put it into context of where they are. So the size of the company matters a lot. And you're going to get opportunities for AI embedded capabilities in your products today from a number of different companies that are out there. So you might already be on the journey with your organization and not even know it because you're embedding capabilities from software vendors that have AI into the organization, adding the efficiency just as you start. So I think that's pretty cool and like a good place to get going. As you start to scale and you want to sort of fuel your organization or maybe fuel your products differently or engage their customers even more differently, um, highly recommend sort of looking at the entire organizational value map, like where do you create value in your organization, starting to path that you point out where you think you've got spots where you can start infusing AI technology into that, um, setting up a team around it that's both cross-functional and includes sort of the corporate functions and legal risk regulatory areas, and start to do proofs of concept. I mean, it's you've got to try this, I think, to see where it fits in your organization. And we talked a little bit earlier about like being willing to sort of have some, you know, stub your toe on a few spots and say, yeah, gosh, we didn't get that right. What did we learn from that? And how are we going to apply it to the next thing we try to go do? Um, those are some ideas. I mean, you got to throw a little bit of money behind it too. You got to make some investment in the space. And yeah. I really encourage organizations too, like you've got to like get out there and talk about it with other people. So in the sense that you don't have to divulge trade secrets. But engage with the vendors that are in the marketplace selling the capabilities because you're going to end up finding opportunities to co-create on a lot of different use cases when you start to engage with that community. And you might find platforms that enable you to do things really efficiently. Um, you're like, oh, wow, cool. That's already built into this. There's like building blocks I can assemble versus having to go build something totally custom on my own. 
And if you're not out there in the ecosystem having those conversations, I think you're going to miss some of those opportunities. Um, so those are a couple of things. You know, I'd say uh, the talent space is also super tricky. Like you've got to make sure you get the right team um, and how you're you know building your own team, keeping them interested in the space as well is hard because it's fast and ever moving. So when you get your AI engineers together, are they happy with the project they're working on? Um, are you giving them the excitement and access to do some of the cool stuff um, that they want to do? And then, you know, the room to grow within your organization. Yeah, I think that's so critical. Jim, it has been phenomenal having you on, hearing your advice and insights. As we wrap up, um, a couple things I wanted to ask you about. Number one, uh, if people want to get in contact with you, where's the best place to do that? Number two, if people are interested in working with Deloitte, what's the best way for them to get started? And then finally, uh, you mentioned something about a Gen AI document that you guys had put together. Yeah. People would be, I'll, I'll drop a link to that in the show notes if you send that over to me. But I'm sure people would you know, love to hear about where they can find that. So maybe talk about that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it, easiest way is over email or LinkedIn. Uh, email is Jim Rowan, all one word at Deloitte.com. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I learn a lot from just having conversations about folks in the marketplace, as I mentioned. So that's great. Uh, Gen AI dossier is the other cool link. I think it just gives you a sense of what use cases are out there in the Gen AI space and how you can sort of get your creative juices flowing about how this can help your organization. Um, so, so thanks, Shane. I really appreciate it. And yeah, those would be great places to start. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. To the listener, thank you so much for tuning in to the AI Chat Podcast. Make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts and have a fantastic rest of your day.